I'm Erie. I am incredibly excited to be here, not only because you all are doing amazing work, uh, but Chai Hack Night inspired me in, in the year of our Lord, 2012, when I was trying to figure out how to make a community around the tech that was struggling to take off in government. So I'm long, long-time fan, first-time visitor, so thank you for having me. Um, so I already mentioned my name. Uh, I used to work for the Ohio Attorney General. I used to, I helped set up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with our Lord and Savior, Elizabeth Warren. Um, I got to work at the White House for the Chief Technology Officer of the country. I was on the founding team of the U.S. Digital Service. Uh, I did a fellowship at Harvard Kennedy School. I founded a group called the Tech Lady Mafia. We're not murderers, usually, um, but that's not who I am. Uh, this is who I am. This is a screenshot I took a few weeks ago, and this is my hometown, uh, Columbus, Ohio. My folks, <gasps> yes, um, and my folks live right about here, and the thing on the map that you're looking at uh, is a screenshot from Zillow of all the active foreclosures in the place that I'm from. I lived in Ohio during the height of the financial crisis, and uh, it became apparent to me that there was a giant systemic failure that meant that families that I'd known since I was a little kid who fought to get in the middle class or were there um, and were happy there were being kicked out and losing their homes as a result of giant systemic failures that were beyond their direct control, control to fix. Um, and I couldn't sleep at night, and I felt bad about the government, and I felt bad about the way my neighbors were being treated, and I felt bad about the prospects that that could get fixed. Um, so I did what any modern one, woman would do, uh, and I sold everything I owned, got in a car, and drove to Washington, D.C., and stalked Elizabeth Warren until she hired me. And oddly enough, it worked. Um, but I like to add this in because this is actually my intro. I'm not obsessed with civic hacking because I was bored. I don't show up to, ha to hack nights like this because I love the food, though I love the food. Um, I do it because I'm worried about my neighbors, uh, because I'm worried about my parents, because I'm worried about my friends, because I'm worried about my teachers, and I know that's why you're here too. So um, after I got to work for Elizabeth Warren, which is awesome, I mentioned briefly the US Digital Service. It's a team in the White House. Um, this is a, a file photo of us. Y if you're wondering where I am, I'm the person laughing so hard you literally can't see my face. It's my natural state of being. Um, this is a more accurate reflection of, of what the team is like. Um, this is a giant group of people that went sort of this, through the same transformation I did. For them, it wasn't foreclosure. For some people, it was because their parents got cancer and health data, they couldn't believe how poorly it was managed and used to help people. Some of the people here, because they themselves are veterans and couldn't believe what it was like to sign up for benefits. Um, but I was really honored to be part of a team that raised their hand and said, we want to come make this better. And for some people, that path is in government, and some people, uh, that path is from the outside in. And to that end, um, I'm gonna, if you'll bear with me, I'd love to do a quick audience census Please raise your hand if you currently work in the government. Thank you. Um, please raise your hand if you have ever worked in the government. Jen? Yeah, okay, great. Good job, everyone. Um, uh, raise your hand if you would like to move into a job either soon or pretty soon uh, where you get to work directly on civic tech for the thing that pays you most of the money you make. Awesome. Um, Raise your hand if you work for a normal country company making rich people richer, but do this for fun because you think about it all the time. Cool. That's awesome, too. Um, thanks for telling me a little bit more about you. Um, so I, I, I said this already, but uh, the story about me being so worried about foreclosures that I sort of changed the trajectory of my life, um, this is your story, too. Uh, does anybody actually want to share what made them start coming to Chai Hack Night quickly? Yes. So I, I oh, sorry. I, I guess I loved transit when I was a kid, and I wanted to design high-speed rail networks. And then I saw after the stimulus was passed, I got really excited and thought that you know high-speed rail was coming. And then I realized that like there was a lot more work needed to be done in our transit system. Yeah. And I, I hear stories like this all the time. Um, I'll be there here this whole time. I really want to hear your story. Um, 
And I wanted to say that you're everywhere. So it's an honor to be here in Chicago, land of soupy pizza that is delicious and um, huge hack nights. But there are people in tiny towns, there are people in even bigger cities, uh, maybe exactly tonight, maybe tomorrow night, who are having very similar conversations and fighting for the same thing. Um, specifically, more than 500 people have raised their hand to actually help lead nights like tonight. Uh, and you're all part of a giant movement. And the movement itself is resilient, even in the face of changing political faces. Uh, it's urgent because you're fighting for your neighbors. And people are counting on you. People are counting on us. Uh, to that point, I wanted to introduce you to Jen Palka, founder of Code for America. She does not love lengthy introductions, uh, but she is a near and dear person to me who also worked on the US Digital Service, the CTO's office, and actually started Code for America. Thank you. Thank you, Erie. Awesome, and thank you for the translation. I'm excited to be here tonight. My biggest announcement is that for the last slide, we will soon have stickers uh, that say, no one is coming, it is up to us. And you can actually get that sticker from us. That's probably the most important thing. Um, I was honored to be here, what was it, last year? A year ago, I talked a bunch about fellowship projects that are uh, have been happening at Code for America, and probably by all rights, I should tell you about some of the work that we're doing at Code for America to take projects that um, have grown out of brigades and out of fellowships and out of hack nights into projects that are now um, scaling both statewide and now nationally. Um, we put out an announcement yesterday. Wait, this is Monday. Couldn't have been yesterday middle of last week um, about a partnership that we're doing with the state of California to take um, something that started in our fellowship program um, called Get Cal Fresh. It's a much, much better way to access SNAP and soon Medicaid um, that'll be in all California counties. But I decided not to talk about that tonight because uh, while the team has been busy doing that work, um, I have been traveling around to some of the other groups that meet um, and trying to get a handle on what we can do to support them better. But while I'm getting a handle on what we can do to support them better, I have come to the pretty <laughs> serious conclusion that um, the, all of the elements that we need to solve our country's problems are right there in the communities around this country. Uh, and we just really need to weave them together better, support them better, uh, highlight them, and we're, I actually kind of think we got this as a country. We need to, who is it, I think Matt Gee just said, we need to mute Silicon Valley, and we need to mute DC, <laughs> and start listening to the voices of people who are actually solving real problems in our communities. Um, so I was just gonna share, instead of stories of, um, uh, of fellowship projects. Um, and by the way, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna go into the whole spiel about what Code for America is, because a lot of you know, and I'm sorry some of you don't, but we'll catch you up. Um, so first stop, um, my husband Tim is here too, and he's been on much of the, many of these trips with me, was to Anchorage, Alaska. Yeah, thank you, he's a good guy. Are we, are we applauding for Tim or for Anchorage? For Tim. Tim, you got some applause. Um, he's a good guy. Um, so to, and Alaska's amazing. So uh, Anchorage, Alaska uh, started our journey of really getting that, uh, I sort of know this, but just getting closer to the work and seeing the people who show up for hack nights in a community like that, which by the way is a smaller community than Chicago, a lot less of a tech presence, so there are many great tech people there. Um, and really, like it's a different community and really different challenges. Um, our host for that uh, couple days uh, was a guy named Brendan Babb, who um, is, um, very, is fond of saying that civic tech was the job he always wished he could have and didn't know was a job, and that this movement sort of gave him his passion in life and the thing that he really loved doing. So he got involved with Code for Anchorage um, near when it got started. Um, as the people who founded it wanted to sort of hand the leadership off to the next person, they handed it off to Brendan. Um, they've done a number of amazing projects. I'll just talk about one or two of them. Um, but then the new mayor was elected, an awesome guy named Ethan Berkowitz, and he decided to hire Brendan as the chief, inf chief innovation officer, first one ever, of, of Anchorage, and sort of make it an official thing. And that's something we're seeing around the country is that there's this, um, there's not like, and we, that's one of the reasons they 
you know, Erie's sort of calling it out. It's not like there's a civic tech community and, and then the people in, in City Hall or in various departments or at the county. It's really one community and people are multi-hatted around the country. Bre you know, Brendan is certainly one of them. By the way, like in Anchorage, um, one of the projects that happens in a lot of brigades around the country is just was early on, of course, just like getting the transit data into GTFS so that it could be consumed and displayed by platforms like Google Maps. Um, in Anchorage, actually, there isn't, I don't know how many apps, how many apps do you have in Chicago for telling you when public transit will be here? Okay, they have one other than like Google Maps in Anchorage and it's the one the brigade built. That's it. That's how people know when the bus is coming. Um, and he said, you should really look, because I think we're using like a pretty significant number of your Twilio credits. And they are, because it's, like, it's the thing that they run. Um, but they're also doing projects. Um, they, they picked up on a lot of the work we've been doing in, um, in food assistance at Code for America with city and county of San Francisco. Uh, and they, they redeployed something called Balance, where you can help people check their balance of their EBT card. EBT is how you spend your, um, your SNAP, your food assistance dollars. Um, they worked with M Relief, which is here, right? In this building even, isn't it? Um, yeah, do we have anyone from, I didn't hear anybody, no one from M Relief here tonight. Um, anyway, they're, like, they're helping people with everything from, food from transit to food assistance and a million other projects. Um, my favorite thing about being in <laughs> Anchorage was that anytime you said Asheville, they got very upset because they're very competitive with Asheville because Asheville um, asked them for help standing up something called, called CourtBot, which I'll talk about in a second. And then uh, Asheville got ahead of them and deployed it before Anchorage did. So this is an amazing sort of like competition between the two. Um, but what a fantastic uh, group of people in you know a small community that doesn't have some of the assets that Chicago has, but it's still just doing remarkable stuff. Um, so from there, we went to Asheville just to, you know, piss the people in Anchorage off. And um, uh, the, here are three of the folks, um, sort of two ex-captains, uh, ex-co-captains, and the current captain is Eric Jackson there. Um, much like in Anchorage, Eric is the head of digital services. So they have their own digital services modeled after the United States Digital Service in Asheville, run by Eric. Um, and he's also is also the, the captain of the brigade. And I, I, I couldn't find the um, uh, I couldn't find the video of, of of Patrick talking, but Patrick is very passionate and wants everyone to know about a sort of revelation that he and others leading Code for Asheville had, which was that they needed to get out of their office and go out into the community. And they met a number of people in the community. Um, one of them here with the arrow over her head, this is a community group that meeting that they took me to. Um, Amy Cantrell runs something called Be Loved, which is a, a shelter for homeless, a service center for homeless people. Um, and uh, Amy explained to them that, in fact, while Asheville has a stated policy of ending homelessness within 10 years, um, they're, in fact, still criminalizing homelessness by ticketing folks who are just sitting on public property or sleeping on public property, ticketing people who are, uh, is it this, give an example of someone who was eating, you know, sitting outside with a pizza box, still eating, but got the guy got ticketed for littering. Um, so sort of looking at the data of the city uh, and then sort of calling the city out on some practices that were at odds with their stated policy and went on from there to um, actually look at the traffic stop data. Um, uh, they have been partnered also with Dee Williams here, who is a community activist um, and trying to get resources for her neighborhood, now running for council. And what I heard was this sort of revelation of the work that Code for Asheville is doing once they got out into the community and found partners who, as in our language, really actually understand a validated user need and started speaking for people. And it's actually both increased in some, in some cases, in some ways, made more tense the relationship with the city, but in a really, really productive manner. So part of the reason they wanted me to come was just to sort of help validate that this dialogue between citizens and their government around the country, um, is, it's happening everywhere, and we're not putting the genie back in the bottle. When they're trying to sort of retreat and say you shouldn't have that data or your data is wrong, um, 
they need to realize they actually need to just push through that and get out there and engage with these, uh, with Code for Asheville and others that are looking at this data and challenging the city on their practices. I would say 85% of the things that the city and the, the Code for America Brigade there work on together are very positive. There's, there's less tension and they're really working together. In the case of the police department, they're working through some real challenges that I think are necessary and important. And I was really glad to be there um, to support them. And I was just really glad there to hear how committed that team is to getting out there and finding partners that help them really understand what's going on from the ground up. Um, Amy and Dee both also said to me, the work that we have done as advocates for the homeless or advocates for certain neighborhoods in Asheville has never been as powerful as it is today that we are partnered with Code for Asheville. We can do things we've never been able to do before by having data and having analysis that we just simply, simply didn't have access to before. Um, it's just a hugely inspiring community there. Um, and went from there to Tulsa. Oh, I think I earlier said that it was Asheville that did court by. Uh, code for Tulsa is one of the first uh, Code for America Brigades to ever register. Um, in fact, I think they were really operating as a group already working before we, we called it a brigade program. Um, Carlos is a graphic designer there who's the current lead of it. Uh, Luke's been sort of co-leading it for a long time as well. Um, one of the reasons I went there is that um, they have a project where they picked up a 2014 Code for America Fellowship project that we did for Atlanta called CourtBot. Um, which is really designed to help people remind, help remind people who need to appear in court to appear. Uh, turns out across the country, and this is different by in different jurisdictions, so forgive me it's not rel if it's not relevant here, but in Baltimore, for instance, where we're about to roll it, it was a, a really similar project. Um, if you're charged with the crime, they just hold you. They don't trust that you're going to show back up to court because there's a very high rate of what we call fail failures to appear. And we know from sort of early studies that when we remind people, you know, just like hand them a piece of paper and say, hope you show up six months from now, um, that they actually will show up to their court dates, especially if you can sort of stay in touch with them and keep, go and keep talking to them. Um, in Tulsa, um, I think it was 60% of people are, are in the jail are just being held prior to trial. If that seems crazy to you and you don't believe me, yeah, I get it. That seems crazy to me too, but that's actually what's happening in jails around our country. People are either held pre-trial or they have finished their time and um, are out on probation and then fail to do something there and get put back in. There's a ton of people unnecessarily imprisoned for a lot of reasons, but particularly just because they're being held pre-trial for often very petty crimes. I asked Carlos how he got involved in this project and basically, he said, uh, a bunch of us at Code for Tulsa go to a particular church, and there's this one woman, Jill, who is the public, uh, assistant public defender there, and she explained to us that all these people are in jail, and we said, hey, we know of a project that might be able to help. So they are actually implementing this now in a pilot where they've con Jill has convinced the person who needs convincing that they're going to try it with 100 people and not hold them pre-trial and try texting them to remind them to show up for their court dates and see if they can't change that policy in Tulsa so that we release those people. I'd ask you to think about a world where we take a project like that, one particular domain, one particular problem within that domain, um, in one particular place, and then multiply it by all the problems we have, <laughs> all the different uh, locations in which we could do them and all the people that are needed to do it. And to me, that, that's, it, I take something like that and I say, if we can fix that in Tulsa and we can fix it in every other jurisdiction and then we can go fix it in other areas where we have problems like this, this is how we solve the problems in our country. So my tour has been a tour of, of inspiration and hope and excitement. I'm um, loving being here. We're going to go to a bunch more places. I don't want to talk all night. I, um, oh, by the way, that's, sorry, that's Jill Webb. Uh, with the arrow over her head. She's the assistant um, public defender who's getting this pilot um, uh, going in, um, uh, in Tulsa with CorpBot. So um, we need brigades in every community in this country. Um, we need all of everybody who's interested in making this vision of our country real to be able to do this work and, and gain any skills that they need to do it. Um, one of the things that we're doing by going to all these communities and trying to tie um, all this work together 
um, is saying, what, what is our common constraint? What is the one thing that we all agree that we're doing? And uh, I think that that thing isn't going to be a coding language. It's not going to be that we all decide to work on criminal justice issues only. Um, but we are trying to socialize a common set of values and operating principles and a common mission. It doesn't mean that you can't, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't do a lot of work outside of this vision, but we would love your feedback as active members of a civic tech community um, on uh, a sort of statement of our um, mission, vision, and values. And we just, if you think it's great, we'd love you to hear, love you to say that. If you think that there are parts of it that don't make sense to you in your expression of yourself as a member of this community doing good work in the world, we want to hear that too. Um, it's not meant to constrain anybody who doesn't want to be constrained by it, but we are trying to make it an active document for Code for America brigades. Um, so please give us that feedback and um, let us. What, what are our other asks? Let us know if you're um, if you're looking if you are interested in a job in government. We're trying to help more people get a job. And um, thank you so much for having us here tonight. One way that a lot of people get involved in civic tech is by getting involved in the technological aspects and the data aspects of electoral campaigns. Um, is that something you want to avoid or something you want to embrace? So my answer would be people getting involved is great however they do it. Um, we're trying to sort of uh, create a center of gravity around people who care about the mechanics of governing outside of um, the political sphere. Um, so certainly no desire to not feed anyone's desire to get involved any way they want. Um, let me move back to here. Um, if we talk about, so I didn't read this, I was in the interest of time, but this is really about how government operates, not uh, once you're elected to office or in, when you're in the bureaucracy or as a citizen. And there are, I think that there are lots of great opportunities for people to get involved in either electoral politics or how we vote um, that are um, very good friends to this vision. Is that, do you want to take a crack at that? Okay. <laughs> I really love this slide and it's really motivating to me. Uh, could you talk more about the third point where better costs less? What are the keys to making that happen? Where is it already being realized? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, uh, yeah, everywhere. So, um, sorry, I keep doing this. I'm going to make uh, Yuri take this, uh, but I want to, um, I do want to say that I think um, government is the one place where uh, until recently it seems Moore's Law doesn't <laughs> actually play out, it is, is not in effect. And um, when you tell people that in fact, the project that they have scoped out could be both, it could be all three, better, faster, and cheaper. They tend not to believe you until you show them that. And I'm going to have Erie um, say a little bit more about projects that have been better than cost less. Um, one of my favorite ones to talk about is the Department of Education decided that they were going to build a college rating system, and it was going to be a website. And then they worked on it for several years, and it didn't launch. Uh, and then the digital service got to work on it with the help of external advocates who were trying to fight for the open data, which was the important part. And we made our first prototype literally out of trash. We had the, you know, like the sticky thing, like the big sticky notes where you can take notes on the wall and peel them off and stick them. We used the back of that to make a fake iPhone. We used strips of scrap paper to mock up the screens and slide them through and test it with prospective college students. That's where we made our first prototype, and it cost nothing, so it was literally made out of trash. And we showed it to the Secretary of Education at the time, Arnie Duncan, and he said, wait a second. So you can start with something that's free and you just kind of mock up instead of waiting until you spent $10 million? Um, in government, sometimes people think about 
a way to avert risk is to make everything perfect and only let people see things that are perfect. But one of the things the people in this room do and people do across the country when they're advocating for the government to work better is to prototype, is to work in an agile manner. And that's typically drastically cheaper than what government has been told they need to spend, what government needs to spend and how they need to spend. Yeah, I also talked last time, sorry, about the California, it's been a year, but a project we did with the state of California to break up a $600 million procurement. That's happening everywhere now, and so they're starting to see more and more that actually, if you do smaller projects that are module or agile, user-centered, that you do get better, faster, and cheaper. Hi, thank you for coming to Chicago. Um, <laughs> so civic tech is an amazing way to participate in dem democracy um, outside of just voting. But how can we make sure that civic tech is representative of our communities when tech itself is not representative of our communities? That's another awesome question. Um, and I think, though, I'm going to, again, let Yuri say more about it. But um, from the empirical evidence that I've seen in the last couple places I've been, it's pretty simple. Get out of the building um, and go talk to people who, um, are, have different set of experiences and needs from you because the thing you need to do to solve your validated user, pro, user uh, need problem is the same thing that will help you with your diversity problem. <clears throat> Plus one. The other thing I would say is some cities have experimented with uh, both taking advantage of advocacy organizations that are out of the building. You can also look at hosting events at places like libraries, civic, or, uh, city hall, there's a lot of spaces that aren't sort of a, a tech space that might look very much like the tech industry that are more inclusive and more welcoming. The other thing is that when we talk about civic tech, people sometimes think of somebody working on you know, an app in Node that will be on an iPhone someday. And I think sort of the original civic hackers that are spread across the country and doing unbelievably difficult work every single day are librarians. So I think that and other, you know, also postal workers. There's lots of different people who um, maybe wouldn't originally consider themselves technologists, but are absolutely hackers of civic institutions to make them work better for vulnerable populations. And I think um, the fact that there's not a perfect answer and instead a process to fight for that inclusion and fight for that representation is, is what's going to keep this movement close to the users and actually successful. Some of these uh, bullet points have, like, costs and serving people with equity. I was just kind of curious if you guys keep metrics on the apps and programs that are developed and whether or not like uh, you can see direct dollar savings or you know money being shared equally or what you guys use to measure the success, the kind of data and metrics of it. So for things at that come out of um, things like get CalFresh, which is an application in California to help people apply for food stamps, yes. Um, every single brigade project that's coming out of brigades across the country, there's 72 today, no. Um, I think individual brigades, in some cases, have found that data to be really compelling to their government partner, and they have prioritized that. In other cases, um, that is like a wonderful side benefit, but the city wants to take it on, or the community wants to take it on, because it's a really, really difficult problem that's hurting people. Yeah. Our we struggle with metrics. I don't know anyone else feels this way, but metrics are hard. I, I, I mean, just not get it, not collecting the data or looking at the data, but knowing what data to get, guide yourself and measure yourself by is really freaking hard. On Get Calfresh, I think we've been on that journey of you want the tech to cost less because that's savings. That's kind of like obvious. But what you really want is you want better outcomes that cost government and, and taxpayers less for better human outcomes for people. So it's just different in every area. We have finally settled on our kind of proxy metric for now is to close the participation gap in California on food stamps, which, by which we mean California is the second lowest user of food stamps per, uh, of the percentage of eligible people in the country. The only state that has a lower participation rate is Wyoming. If you if the data already show, we didn't, need to, we didn't need to collect data to show that it is the program most highly correlated with better health and education outcomes for kids, um, then every kid or every adult who's not on that program is like a bad outcome because you're it, not, not in terms of the dollar spent, but in terms of 
uh, a kid making it through school, a kid not ending up in the criminal justice system, et cetera. Um, so we're measuring ourselves on that as a for now proxy metric for a better outcome for people that isn't just like we're saving the government money because our because our system costs very little and the legacy system costs eight hundred million dollars to build and eighty million dollars a year to maintain. Um, I think it's also totally true in the criminal justice system. It's really hard to figure out what is the metric that actually measures a better outcome for people. But if we don't hold the civic tech and government tech community to the standard of this is only really good if at the end of the day the people in your community actually get better outcomes, then we're not holding government to the standard that we should. And we're not holding 21st century government to that standard. So <clears throat> you all have talked about getting out of the building and about the solutions being out in our community. Could I trouble you to provide some examples for folks who maybe ha have come to Hack Night, they want to learn about something, maybe they already have a group or something that they're working on. What would be some examples of how they could get out of the building and improve what they're working on? Do you want to start? Sure. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a great question, and sometimes it can seem a little bit intimidating to do all of your work, all of your volunteer work, and then do it out in the field. It can seem like a lot. My recommendation would be to start as simply as you possibly can. So for example, I have in Washington DC where I live, we have advisory neighborhood commissions. It's sort of like aldermen in Chicago, I think, um, and attending their public meetings and talking with them about what they're doing and meeting other advocates who are there. So if, let's say you're really passionate about the issue of homelessness. That's a place where you can connect with other advocates who are working on that. That's a place where you can talk to the decision makers and hear what kind of questions they have or problems that they're struggling with. I think another good example is, again, I'm, I'm a stand for libraries, I can't help it, is libraries where you often find people going there for social services or for assistance using government services um, and just going and talking to people. These are your neighbors, they are, they are excited when somebody walks up to them and say, hey, I'm trying to design something that works better, do you want to try it out? Or, hey, I'm sort of wondering what your experience has been like trying to use the bus, or, or whatever, whatever project you're working on. It doesn't have to, I think starting small and getting comfortable is really important, and my number one tip are public meetings in the library. Uh, <clears throat> I've been doing this uh, Chai Hack Night thing for about four years now, and uh, one of the things that comes up is that we get a lot of new people through here. Um, how many people are here for the first time? <laughs> so you can see we have quite a few people that come here for the first time. Everybody has great ideas when they come in and uh, want to start working on a project. And maybe don't take close enough look at who else has done that. So um, what is Code for America? I don't see anything in your operating, your mission statement and operating principles that addresses uh, what Code for America is doing to create a, a civic tech commons? Yeah, that's a really, really, really great question. And my short cheat answer would be, can we get back to you in like two months? Because we're actively working on this. We had some pretty, uh, and Christopher can, can speak to this. Um, uh, we know that's a need, and we've had some sort of false starts on trying to solve it. I would false starts is probably the wrong word. I would say we've done some sort of MVPs that should have minimum viable products that should have then been iterated on a number of times. But um, our progress has not always been linear. We've sort of like tried things and then pulled back, and then it's time to go back at it. Um, I would I would say that at the same time I see a degradation in the like ways that we tried to make that happen and <laughs> didn't. I also see an increase in the ways that it's happening naturally. And so my instinct would be look for the positive deviance, figure out what's working there and support that. But we are often wrong about where we should put Code for America resources. And um, we're hopefully at least humble enough to know that and go back and go, OK, <laughs> that was a lot of work for something very few people use. Um, do, we, do we figure we totally missed the mark and we should throw it out? Do we figure we should? try a couple different uh, iterations on that given that we missed the mark the first time? Or do we, do we also then go, wait a minute, but this court bot thing, for instance, is sort of like naturally spreading um, through human contact, not through an API or a discoverability thing on our website. And so 
how do we also just follow that thread and say, okay, we can obviously make more of that happen because we can see how it's happening. So right now what we're trying to do is we have two lists that we're working from. The first list is give us all the things that you want to learn about. And we've had several contributors on there. Um, I've shared our Code for America Slack invite uh, a couple times. I'll share it again tonight. Uh, we've been having those conversations on our Slack, which connects sort of all the different groups like this across the country together. So on one list, we have everything we want to learn. We're developing another list on, OK, here's everything that's ever been written about those topics here, and then trying to figure out the most efficient way to make that accessible to everyone, and then at the same time, make it easily updatable, which is harder than it sounds. So it's one of the things that we're working on. I'm hoping to make more progress on it this quarter or the next. There's also a weird thing, sorry to, to add, pile on, but there's a weird thing also of like Matt, um, projects that are not the same project but follow a certain pattern. So you guys sort of famously here um, worked on a project to um, predict when to close the beaches because of high rates of E. coli. Like that exact, very good job. I've been telling people about it around the country. But like what I find is a bunch of people have done really, really similar things, but they're more about E. coli. They were about like, how do we predict where we should put um, fire inspectors instead? You know, like uh, how, how do we sort of take that data? And there's sort of clusters of things that just are in certain patterns where it would also be great to have like the people who are doing that project in San Francisco talk to the teams here who did the E. coli thing, not because it's the same project, but because it, there's a lot in common to learn from each other. So we're, we're trying to, sorry, we're trying to do something where we're weaving, like there's at least four dimensions, but three of them are, how do you support things locally? How do you support things across sort of specific areas? Like if you guys are doing criminal justice work, are we connecting you with the other ones you're doing? And then there's like language framework, you know, uh, what are the, ta you know, what are the language, what are the tactics? There's a really, really complex sort of multi-dimensional weaving of the community, if you look at it nationally, that's hard to support, but we're, the hard doesn't mean you don't do it. <laughs> I was just looking at the Wikipedia page and looking at your board of directors. So I saw you have Fred Wilson, I assume, on there from Union Square Ventures or I Union I think you might be on the wrong organization. Uh, code for, well, it's on there. Uh, it actually says Union Square Ventures, one of your board of directors on Wikipedia. So you might want to change that. He is not. Yeah, it's on there. <laughs> But anyway, what I was more getting at That's is, what are, how are the resources in regard in regards to, uh, you know, like the founder of eBay or people that are working with you all, with them bringing their knowledge base or think tank to help you all kind of streamline the process, well, almost like a GitHub in a way. I'll make sure I understand the question. Um, how are the people who are funding us also supporting us beyond money? Yes. That's a great question. Um, so some of our bigger funders are Omidyar Network, which was founded by Pierre Omidyar, founder of eBay, um, uh, Google, um, the Knight Foundation, uh, uh, um, who am I missing? Big ones. Oh, Reid Hoffman. Um, and I would say each of them contributes in a really different and unique way, but each of them contributes materially. I would credit, for example, when I say metrics are really hard, um, I think Omidyar has really held us accountable to coming up with meaningful metrics over the past three years in a way that's made us think really, really, really hard about like what, is, what are the outcomes that we as an organization and we as a movement should be driving towards um, and do many, many, many iterations on it. And like they're great because they're not just there to sort of like hold us accountable, They're, they were really there to help us think it through and come up with something that wasn't bullshit. And I have seen organizations live and die by having set the wrong metric, which then they sort of have to game, and then all of the resources go into gaming the metric instead of getting a meaningful outcome. I'm sure everyone in the room could think of things like that. Um, uh, Reid Hoffman it plays a really sort of different role. I think he has really iterated with us on our strategy. I think. Honestly, he's the person almost most responsible for playing us back to ourselves and saying, you have a center of gravity here around projects that help vulnerable people. The jobs, justice, and food framework that now drives our internal projects, 
he was like, why don't you just do that? <laughs> I was like, oh my god, why not? So a lot of it's just sort of in dialogue and feedback, but they all sort of bring something, something unique to the table in, um, in terms of thought and then connections to others. Does that help answer your question? Uh, so Eric was on the board for a relatively short time, um, but he I can was. That. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so Eric Reese, in addition to helping Code for America, is the most available person I've ever asked for help from. Um, I was part of the team that stood up the digital service at the VA. It was really hard. Uh, the organization serves more than eight million veterans. The, the, all of the tech is older than I am. They have very little resources. The cycle times were over a year for software pushes. Eric Reese showed up to our office. I think he was made, made aware of this work, work by Jen and Code for America. He showed up to our office for two hours and essentially gave group therapy to the team that was trying to ship products. So that's not true of every single funder, but um, I think, or past or current board member, but I think people, people crave an opportunity to serve. It's the same reason why you're here. It's the same reason these people want to serve on the board. They want to make it better. And I think part of our challenge as a movement is to design opportunities for people to contribute in a way that's meaningful. And so for someone like Eric Reese, who developed this way of thinking about work, that's incredible. But how can we look for other opportunities to, for people to contribute in ways that are really meaningful for the skills that they bring? And I think, I think that's a great question. Hey. Um, hey. So um, as you may have noticed when we were going around and doing our introductions, there aren't a lot of journalists that show up to Shy Hack Night. And I think part of that has to do with um, journalists as a, as a uh, kind of profession or genuinely skeptical of like governments and like what they say about themselves and what motivates them. Um, and it's interesting to me because like this community has uh, kind of uh, kind of an antagonistic role to play in terms of like getting governments to, to remain accountable, but also like could could you know work with governments. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, are there examples that you know of like in this country where communities have successfully played both roles where they are kind of like antagonistic and and uh, play, play the role of like, you know, keeping governments accountable as well as, uh, I, I don't know, helping out? Um, I think one of the things we're trying to articulate about the Code for America network um, is uh, that we are primarily carrot with some stick when necessary. <laughs> um, but that makes us a little bit unique. There are fewer groups out there that say, first and foremost, we're going to assume positive intent on the part of government and try to help them do the right thing rather than sit outside and, um, say, and, and hold them accountable when oftentimes they simply cannot do it. They just don't have the resources or the skills or the mechanisms or approaches. That said, I just came from Asheville where it was absolutely appropriate and right and necessary to play a little of the stick role. And to your point, this person here is David and he runs the Asheville Blade and he comes to all of these community meetings that are, there are all these people are different, different stakeholders in the community that work with Code for Asheville on their agenda and um, uh, he's like an integral part of this. He's sort of like the alternative paper there. Um, in fact, it's supported by Patreon. Everyone should support them. It's a great organization. But um, I do think that, that journalism more is going to be in the stick and we're, and, and brigades are going to be more in the carrot, but they have to work hand in hand. Um, they have to also work hand in hand because the work that brigades do actually needs to be seen by more than just the brigade. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, there are some brigades that are almost exclusively working with journalistic, uh, you know, working with journalists and newspapers to, to get their work done because they're not getting as much attention from city government, and that's the only way to get their attention. Do you want to add to that? Um, I would say that the bleeding edge of a lot of particularly the open data work is to interview the ideal end users of the open data. So for example, not a data scientist, but 
um, a, a single mom who's comparison shopping for apartment apartments and is trying to figure out, um, you know, if which house has lead in it, for an example. Um, sh she might not go download the full data set and do the analysis herself, but if you ask her, well, how do you know what neighborhood is safe? How do you know which house is the best one to rent? They will name local news stations, they'll name the local paper, and so I've seen open people working in open data go to those places and say, hey, I interviewed 10 people who were house shopping in these neighborhoods. They all named your outlet as the place where they get this information. Let's do a partnership to make the data we are freeing accessible and available to help them actually make a consumer choice. So I think it takes creativity. As a former government person, sometimes when it was, you know, here's a journalist who wants to report on what you're doing, it made it a lot harder to do the work that they could then report on. Um, the other side of it is Code for America meetups or hack nights or places like Chai Hack Night are the only place that a lot of government workers feel like they can attend and they're not you know, grilled and chased out of the room because they're there for help and they're there because they wanna build something. And I think the thing that I always try and remind journalists, but also government workers, but also activists, is that everybody's a person. I mean, I know we all know this, but um, if government sucked because one person was in the basement cackling and petting a very fluffy cat, this would all be much easier. Um, so I think that assuming really good intentions and asking for the best out of people is, the, is a, a good approach. I think you've talked about a couple, uh, but what have some of your biggest obstacles been? And I know you talked about where better costs less. Um, is open source some of, um, you know, within your initiatives to, you know, work with or... So most of our projects are open source, but we have, but in kind of in name only. So part of the work that um, Erie and others are uh, taking on is to sort of make us actually open source, where you can figure out what things are and what's needed. And oh God, Carl Fogel is now staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> I am shamed. Uh, um, but yeah, so like the, certainly all the brigade projects are, we have one major project that had to close source because we had some privacy issues and some other issues that are happening. Um, but I, I do think we're finally seeing the original thesis come to light, which is if it's open source, it might spread. Um, oftentimes that spread is actually rewriting it though because there's a lot of, um, a, a project is originally written not to scale, it's written to do one thing in one place and to generalize it. It often means completely starting over, but um, but at least the inspiration is there, and they're able to sort of pick stuff up. Um, um, I'll, I'll do obstacles, but I want Yuri to say anything she wants to about open source before we move on. Um, the only thing I was going to say is this ties back to the question earlier about standing on shoulders. I think working in the open and, and being serious about being both an open source contributor and um, relying on open source to make our work better makes it so we're reinventing the wheel less often, which is one of the reasons I'm very excited about it. Um, we could definitely be doing better, and uh, I'm, I'm very glad that that's at the top of mind for you. Can I, Aunt, do, oh, we need to wrap up? We talk a lot. We, we do. Just, yeah. But we're doing it for, for Yana. Yeah. <laughs> like, <Yes. laughs> yeah, uh, lots of men can talk for a long time now when we're done. Um, uh, so I mean, the, the obstacles question is a good one. It, I, I could sort of play it back and say, well, obstacles to what? Because there's a lot of different things. Um, I would say it, mo if we think generally, if I, I'm looking across what I would call the movement for 21st century government, I would say the biggest one is sustainability of the work, whether it's sustainability of brigade leaders to continue to organize their communities without burning out, sustainability of projects, uh, you know, uh, that get done to show what's possible, but then aren't created in a way that is going to operate on its own forever. Um, uh, and I think we are working our way through those things. I think as we actually tackle the obstacles and barriers that have come our way, what we have to also realize is that this movement is on an arc and we are in a different phase of the maturity of the civic tech movement every year. So we can't solve like yesterday's problems uh, we have to solve today's and tomorrow's problems. And part of what I mean by that is like, um, when we started out, I think we're all 
sort of in this boat. Like, it's really easy to look at something and go, like, we could just do that better. Like, I could make a better website. Um, do that a couple times, and you will eventually find the thing that drags you down the rabbit hole, or as Weaver would say, like, lets you peer over the abyss into the ways in which it's not just the website. It's a whole bunch of really entrenched, really complex uh, business processes, cultures, regulations, laws, policies, people that are not going to be solved by the website that you built that is way better than the other thing. Um, and that is sometimes depressing, but is basically the gift that we are given to see that and to understand that and to, it, to embrace that complexity, embrace that chaos, and sort of say, okay, I didn't come in with the tools to solve this problem. I came in thinking we could make a nicer website. Holy. Uh, but I think that the movement overall, not just our projects at Code for America, but what I see across the country is people are saying, yes, OK, this is way harder than I thought. This is way more complex. I mean, VA is a great example. I would say SNAP is, we've learned that really deeply. And of course, the criminal justice system. Like, it's not going to, CorkBot isn't going to solve all of the problems alone. Um, uh, but we're starting to develop, I think, theories of change that match the deep, deep complexity of the problem that we're trying to solve. I think Carl would have an, several hours to say about that when it comes to healthcare as well. Um, I, I started writing a blog post last night. Um, that starts with that um, quote from John Gall, Systematics, about all complex system that systems that work started from simple systems that work. And you cannot make a complex system that doesn't work work without throwing it out and starting it, o starting it over. And I'm like, yeah, right. And that is a wise and wonderful thing to say. And in government, that is not really an option. So like, we are at the limit, I think, of our understanding of what you do about complex systems that don't work. Um, throwing it out and starting it over, if you say that in the context of government, that's called revolution and people die. A lot of people die. Now, a lot of people are dying in our country right now today, and more people will die if certain other things happen. But like, we want to do this peacefully, so we have to come up with new theories of change. And I think that is really where we are as a movement, is like getting the giant pile of dew that we stepped in, getting the like abyss of how messed up government is and saying, yes, we choose to continue to try to figure this out despite the fact that the tools and thinking that we came into it with are way insufficient. Was that depressing? Yeah.